Okay, melting, freezing, sublimation. As, as the temperature of a solid increases, the particles move faster and faster, and at some point they get enough energy that they can start moving around, the, breaking the intermolecular forces, and the solid melts. A similar thing happens with the solid-liquid transition that happened with the liquid-gas transition. Remember how the temperature stayed the same? As, as gas sorry, not gas molecules, as water molecules move from the solid state to the liquid state, they, uh, that sentence just doesn't have a good ending. As long, I'll just read, as long as ice and water are both present, the temperature will be zero degrees Celsius. Anytime you have a mixture of water and ice, the temperature is going to be zero. That's the melting point of ice, of water, at one atmosphere. The pressure affects it a little bit, but not as much as the boiling point. It's only after all of the ice has melted that you'll see an increase in temperature. As you put more heat in, that heat is used to break intermolecular forces and set those molecules free into the liquid state. The temperature doesn't go up until all of the intermolecular forces have been messed up enough and everything's swimming around as a liquid. Then the temperature can go up. And so we see a very similar heating curve. Here we're starting at minus 20. When we get up to zero degrees, melting begins. But the temperature remains constant until all of the water has melted. We know that adding ice to a glass of water cools it off, right? That's why we put ice in our drinks. The melting ice absorbs energy from the drink because melting is an endothermic process. So it will absorb energy from your drink and cool the drink. Freezing is exothermic. It releases energy. And that's where I got sidetracked starting about talking about the, the freezer. The water in your freezer turns into ice because the freezer is removing heat from the inside of the freezer. So it's sucking out heat, and that causes the water to freeze. Um, in Reedley, which is just down the road a piece, um, with a lot of fruit trees, a lot of citrus trees, there's some up here in Fresno too. And in the winter, we'll get freezing temperatures. If it gets down to 26 degrees Fahrenheit for more than about four hours, the oranges can freeze. And that damages them, and farmers don't like that, of course. Um, so they're always watching the temperature and trying to keep the oranges from freezing. And one of the techniques they use employs the exothermic nature of the freezing of water. They will flood the fields with water. As the water freezes, the temperature's dropping, gets down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the water begins to freeze. As it freezes, it releases energy. And the temperature near the water stays at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. If we look at this graph and think about going the other way, temperature's going down, temperature's going down, farmers are getting nervous. Okay, water in the field. The water in the field, as it freezes, releases energy and the temperature stays the same. And then they throw in some of those big wind machines to blow that air around because it's only going to moderate the temperature close to the water. But oftentimes that's enough to keep the trees from freezing. So chemistry in farming, who knew? Well, there's energy involved here. Um, here it's called the heat of fusion instead of the heat of melting. I'm not sure why, but fusion is another word for melting. And if you have a hard time remembering that, think of chocolate chips. 
So you put chocolate chips in a pan and you heat them up and they melt, right? As they melt, they fuse together into one big lump of chocolate. Yum, right? So fusion is melting. So the heat of fusion, heat, amount of heat needed to melt one mole of a solid. So heat of fusion for water, 6.02 kilojoules per mole. So delta H for this reaction is positive because you have to put it in, put energy in. How does this number compare to the heat of vaporization? 40.7. This is a lot lower, isn't it? To melt something, you don't have to completely break the intermolecular forces because a liquid is still being held together by intermolecular forces. It just has enough kinetic energy that the particles can slide around. When you go to the gas state, you have to completely destroy all those intermolecular forces, and that requires more energy. Freezing water. The, uh, the same amount of energy is involved, but now it's being released instead of being absorbed. So just like we used heat of vaporization, we can use heat of fusion to calculate the amount of heat energy needed to melt um, a specific amount of solid. And we just use that heat of fusion as a conversion factor. So let's calculate the amount of heat absorbed when 15.5 grams, that's wrong. Anybody spot the mistake in that problem? Absorbed. No, that's not wrong. This is my brain on dextromethorphan. It's not pretty. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's just do the problem. 15.5. Ah, We're going to treat this the way we did the other one. We're starting with a, an amount of ice and it says amount of heat. Well, it doesn't say what kind of unit it wants. Um, if we go back to the previous, here, 602, that's the number we need. Well, delta H of fusion, and this is too messy, um, is 6.5. What was the number? Six point. Zero two. Thank you. Kilojoules per mole. Fusion is absorbing energy. This situation we have energy being absorbed, and so it's going to be positive. Um, so this has kilojoules in moles. So kilojoules would be the most convenient unit. We need moles in the middle. Moles often end up being in the middle. 15.5 grams of water will convert to moles, and then we'll convert to kilojoules. One mole of water weighs 18.016 grams. Now you can probably tell how I've got that memorized. I keep using it over and over again. And there's 6.02 um, kilojoules per mole. It's just, that reminds me of Avogadro's number. I can. Times 6.02. So I'm getting an answer. This should have three sig figs, um, 5.18 kilojoules. Any questions? Let's call it a day. <laughs>